Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about education. Now, if you're familiar with what the podcast is and who I am, I'm a former educator. The goal of Reverend Concepts, the goal of Coaching in Session, ties a special role where Reverend Concepts, we aim at limiting beliefs that are stem from the school system. And Coaching in Session is a platform that I talk about the work I do as a coach, and then also bringing on other wonderful coaches that can talk about the work that they do. Because it's important for us to understand that there's resources for us to be better. For example, if a new iPhone comes out, do you keep the old one and you ignore the new one? No, 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 right? You're like, oh, wait, the new iPhone came out. I need the new iPhone. But what would happen if we said, you know what? There's a new coach in town, right? This coach is going to be able to help us fix our problems, right? And there might be nothing wrong with our old iPhone. Maybe it's a little bit slower because Apple likes to do those updates that slow down the old generations of phones. So you will be more inclined to get the new one. They admitted it, but that's neither here or there, right? We're talking about education. We're talking about people and coaches. And what we can expect is that, yes, you might have received coaching before. You might have received guidance or in education. And you might think, well, I got my education. I got what I needed. But as times change, so do the methods of how we address it. And it's important to understand the different types of education, how our kids learn, how parents are perceiving the education system, how teachers are operating in the education system, because we can look at the good, we can look at the bad. And right now, a lot of people are looking at the bad. They don't necessarily see the good that's happening, whether it be, okay, well, we're going away from the curriculum, we're doing certain things. But what tends to be happening right now is that many people are shying away from the public schools, they're shying away from the standards of learning, and they're trying to take that role and put it onto themselves. And though it's a good thing to make sure that your child has a great education and that they're prepared for the world, It's difficult for a parent to really show up and be able to fill in all the holes that a teacher would, that a classroom would, because the the way the brain develops is, yeah, you might have them at your house and they will be safe and they will be secured and you can teach them exactly what you want. But those opposing views that they're going to be introduced with at school, maybe some incidents of bullying, that's going to help them grow. And though it might not be like a rampant bullying or that there's so many skewed points and maybe the politics of what school is or the world, there's more to that. And we have to be able to understand what education is. How can we make education better? And today, I'm bringing on Melissa Lowry, who's going to be an education coach and a principal, who's going to be talking about the work she does, and then also just looking at the school system, looking at the different grade levels, and then trying to figure out, all right, What can be the most feasible next step to make sure that we're raising wonderful children, wonderful leaders of the next generation? It's so important that we do that because if we don't, then we're dooming ourselves to have a more difficult, challenging future. We can make the change today, but we first have to understand what is missing and then how to fix it. So let's get into the interview with Melissa and myself. Welcome, Melissa Lowry, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I have you on as an education coach and a principal. I know in the world of education, especially today, everything has become so, I guess, chaotic from the pandemic to how the curriculum is being formed. I mean, there's a lot to it. And education is one of those things that play a pivotal role in our child's development. And it takes a strong educator, someone who has the best intentions for our youth to really make a difference. And I know that's what you do. But can you explain your work as an education coach and then maybe even talk about your life as a principal too? Oh, absolutely. So first, thanks so much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. And as an education coach, what I'm essentially doing is building a bridge between the classroom and the family room. And I am helping parents and teachers or parents in schools to develop strong relationships 
because both parties, the guardians, the parents, and the school are going to be a major influence on any child's development. And I think that in today's world with so much easy access to information, it's very difficult to disseminate which information is what you should go with versus information that is ill-advised or untrue or is not going to be in the best interest of a child. And so sometimes it's nice to have a voice of someone who's been doing this for 20 something years to be able to assist a parent in the education process. So that's part of what I do. And that's everything from meeting with parents to talk about how to implement a parenting program at home. It could also be looking at psychoeducational evaluations for students with learning disabilities, and then talking with parents about how to advocate for their children when it comes to implementing accommodations in the classroom at the school level. And it could also be working with schools themselves on professional development and things of that nature to help their teachers develop better strategies for actually working with and partnering with parents. It's extremely important to have parents be aware and to give teachers the resources they need in order to be effective at their job. I was a teacher for several years before transitioning over into the world of coaching and and having my own business. And during those years, I never resented those years. I never resented going in on a day. I wasn't worried about the pay. I wasn't worried about the treatment. It was about the kids. So it's hundred percent about them. I, you know, how can I give the best to them, right? How can I give hundred percent? And I gave hundred percent every day, except one. I remember one day it was because I just wasn't feeling good. And I learned a huge lesson that day where if I don't give hundred percent, they can read me like a book. They were trying to have a field day with me. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna give hundred percent, right? Because I gave myself that mindset. Oh, I'm sick. I'm not feeling too well. Well, let me give them, you know, 50%. Maybe, maybe I can scrounge through the day. They knew that 50% was present. <laughs> so they gave me a run for my money. So after the first class, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna change it. I'm just gonna go hundred percent. And I did, and I went hundred percent. I didn't care how it felt. It was about them. I didn't have any more hiccups. So it was just that morning hiccup. And it was a great class too. So it's interesting for me to see that, how if a parent doesn't show up or if a teacher doesn't show up, kids can see that. Right now, we have, I guess, a generation of parents who have a hands-off approach where it's kind of like, okay, we're going to send the kids to school and then education doesn't continue at the house, if, if that makes any sense. Education doesn't end when the school bell rings. And at the end of the day, the kids come home. Yes, they might be sitting around the dinner table. The parent asks, hey, what did you learn today? And kids like, I don't know what I learned because they didn't know they had to give a summary report to their parent, number one. And then number two is kind of like, oh, yeah, I learned this and that. And it's going to appease the parent versus really looking at education and then saying, okay, well, how can we make this better or how can we reinforce this? And I think many parents miss that. It's important for people to understand education as a whole, because education is not as simple as, okay, open to page 10, let's read it. And then now you know it because there's different types of learners, right? So you have your kinesthetic, you have your auditory and your visual type of learners, right? So all of those different types of learners are going to be different. How many parents do you think know what type of learner their child is? I'm going to argue not many. I would say the majority do not know what type of learner their child is. So they might do a mix of things like tell them what to do, show them what to do, move their body in the right way, but they kind of just gamble. And then that's kind of where they are. Education is understanding, okay, how this child learns. And everyone is unique, even though you have a classroom full of kids or people. You have to be able to facilitate a learning curriculum, a lesson plan that's going to promote good learning. And so when we're getting into the education coaching aspect of it, right, what are some of the prime things that you teach parents and some of the prime things you teach educators to give 100% to be effective communicators and to identify what the kid needs? Wow. I mean, you just brought up like mind blown, like so many different things that we could, that could be their own separate podcast. But going back to the three questions you just asked, I think when it comes to working with parents, it's helping them to identify the best way for them to communicate with and support their children. Because a lot of times, like I always say, parents never tutor your own kids unless you are an expert in a subject and your child wants that influence. Because Oftentimes, when parents move to a teaching role, 
which we saw was a disaster during the pandemic overall, or to a coaching role, that doesn't always work very well. And so what I often say to parents, try and stay out of that role so that you can continue to be the cheerleader and you can continue to be the safe space for your child and actually let the school and the teacher do their job, which is holding the child accountable at school for academics and things of that nature. And that doesn't mean there isn't a consequence at home, but as far as creating a safe space where students feel like they can come home and their parents are going to be on their side, their parents are going to advocate for them, their parents are going to support them. I think that's something that's really important and it helps to strengthen the relationship between the parent and the child as opposed to damage or erode that relationship. And so I try and work with parents on separating themselves in their roles. And four questions that I will often give parents to help them facilitate communication Because I think what will happen is like a middle schooler brings home an F and mom flips out or dad starts to yell and then it just ratchets itself up and then everyone's slamming the doors and nothing productive comes out of the conversation. So what I've said to parents is when you're advocating and kind of being not really a coach, but sort of a coach, the four questions are what went right? What went wrong? What do I replicate? And what do I change? Because the grade is in the book it's over. And there's nothing the student can actually do at that point to change it. And so what I always say is if something has gone really, really well, you affirm your child and you say, well, what in that process went right? If you earned an A on that project, walk me through what you did to earn that A. And so you're reinforcing the behavior that that child engaged in to earn that. And then you would say something like, how would you replicate that somewhere else? Like, wow, that was awesome on that science project. How would you take the skills that you built and the strategies that you utilize and apply them in language arts or in another subject area? Conversely, if a child comes home with a C, a D, an F, and actually Cs aren't bad, sometimes a C is the best a child can do. But if that child comes home with a low grade, most of the time they're already embarrassed. They already feel bad about it. They don't need someone else yelling and screaming at them and it's not productive. So you take a failure bow, as I like to say, and I did not coin that. I can't remember where I found it, but I'm not the originator. But they take a failure bow and the parent says, you know, okay, what went wrong in the process? Talk to me about what went wrong and then identify it because sometimes it's an extenuating circumstance. Let's say that the night before there was a horrible storm and you lost all your power. You didn't have access to the internet and you couldn't go to Google Classroom to access something. And so it affected your grade. Mom and dad can, or the guardian can say, you know what? That's okay. We're going to let that go this time. And then is there something we could have done? Could you have printed your notes ahead of time? Could you have whatever? Or was it that you didn't study? Was it that you made note cards and that's not effective for you? And help the child engage in what we call metacognition, which is just fancy for thinking about thinking. How do I learn? And so when you say what went wrong, and then how do I change that next time? You're actually empowering your child to feel like he or she's in control. And that's something that's very important to young learners is feeling as though they can have an influence over their own future. And when moms and dads engage in those four questions, it oftentimes can prevent an escalation and it can prevent a conversation from really going sideways. And then it also helps arm the child for a future experience because they've thought about, okay, what went right? How do I apply that somewhere else? Or what went wrong and how do I change that going forward? And so I have found that universally, regardless of who I'm working with and regardless of the age, those four questions when posed, you know, developmentally appropriate, a five-year-old is going to look a little different, you know, than a 15-year-old. It can be really transformative in the relationship that the parent has with the child. And then it actually can be transformative in that homeschool relationship because the parent is actually helping the teacher in a lot of different ways, because those are skills that we are often trying to impart. It's like people call it executive function. We're trying to get our students to understand how they learn so that they can take advantage of that or they can pivot and develop other different skills to rise to the occasion and to do well in school. And so it actually starts to strengthen that partnership. I'm going to touch base on that before we get into the 100% teacher aspect. You are completely correct when it comes to parents should have a role being a parent. I know a parent might be a teacher. They might be a great educator, but it's different when it's your kid. You said it, the pandemic was an awakening for many parents. It's like, man, this is what I have to do. This is tough, right? 
And then that was when a lot of parents were going on TikTok and on Instagram, they're saying, teachers, we need you. We love you. They're basically praising <laughs> teachers because they understand that their child is not the sweetest thing that they thought they were. And so, so now they're really getting tested every single day, their patients, and it requires a different type of patience for your own kid versus someone else's kids, right? In school, you are putting yourself in that mindset. As a former educator, when I was going to school, I was like, these are not my kids, but I want the best for them versus they're my kids. They're going to do good, right? So it's like my mind is a little bit different on the expectations. So I'm willing to work with someone as many times as it needs to be versus in home. I would like one time, let me tell you one time and you do it versus I got to tell you a hundred times, but that's the reality, right? And to separate that, and sometimes parents have a difficult time doing that because they are busy, right? Most likely their work is not education. So they might have maybe accounting, maybe an engineer. So they have stress from work. And then now they have to deal with the stress from education, from teaching. And it's a lot. It's a lot for parents. And it's not that parents can't do the job because there is an avenue that you can take to bring education from a parent to child base. It's just that it's less than likely. It's easier for a teacher to come in and then say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to teach the curriculum and I'm going to teach what they need. I'm going to teach where they are. And then that child grows. But then we have to look at the aspect of just because it's a teacher's role to teach, how can we ensure that the teachers are giving 100%? How can we be sure that the teachers are teaching the correct thing? You know, sometimes the, you know, the curriculum is there, but then sometimes the ideas of what the teacher would like to think or the opinions of what the teacher would like to instill onto her class kind of fall into the mix of what education is. So kind of looking at that aspect and then 100% every single day. So in addition to being an education coach, I serve as the principal of a K-8 to Catholic school here in Atlanta, Georgia, where I live. And so part of that role is providing educational leadership for the faculty and staff. And we have about 80 faculty and staff that work at my school, in addition to about 570 students in grades K to 8. So developmentally, we have a wide range of students. We start in kindergarten and we go all the way through eighth grade. And so when I'm working with my faculty and I'm looking at teachers who might be at the very beginning of their career, and so their teacher toolbox is not as full of different strategies, then I have mid-career teachers, I like to say, who they've got a really good toolbox going, but they're looking for opportunities to really expand and better themselves. And then you have very veteran teachers, some of whom are in that great place in their career when they have mastered the curriculum so much that they can take it and notch it up like a whole just crazy awesome level. Or you have the people where you're like, yeah, might be time for you to retire. And so on, and in any given year or any given day, I am working with people who maybe their definition, let's say of 100% might be slightly different than one of their colleagues. And so something that I try and do with the faculty is I try and keep us focused on what our mission is. And when we talk about wanting to give 100%, I think that a lot of educators through the pandemic, they're tired, they are beaten up. And yes, there was a time when everyone was like, oh, we love teachers, we need teachers. But also kind of when the pandemic was halfway there, so like 2021-ish to the end of the school year, 2022, people were just mad. They were mad if you were wearing masks. They were mad if you weren't. They were frustrated if their kids hadn't learned virtually. They were upset with quarantines. Everyone was mad. And teachers really received a lot of the brunt of that anger. And it, it was just misplaced frustration. But here nor there, a lot of teachers just were very tired. And so what I've said to my teachers, I know you're tired. I know you have been putting forth a lot, but I want us to really focus on what our mission is. And our mission is to educate the whole child. How do we do that? And how do we do that together as a group? And so I've really tried to prevent the teachers from feeling like they're an island and feeling like they're all by themselves and saying, no, 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 no. We are all on one ship together and we are sailing together. And if one of us is struggling, all of us are struggling. And then how do we come together to influence each other, to share with one another so that we're not feeling isolated and alone? And as a teacher, you would know that you can close your classroom door and not see another adult for hours at a time. And it can be an isolating profession. 
And so the number one thing is really sticking with the mission and making sure that, that the teachers feel connected to one another through that mission. And that doesn't have to just happen in a religious school such as mine. That can happen in the public school. That can happen in a private school. It doesn't matter. But mission and then that collegiality that comes with it, I think is something that's very important because if the culture that you are leading as an educational leader like myself is not healthy, that doesn't mean it's Pollyanna-ish. It doesn't mean that no one disagrees or debates. But it's not healthy, which means people can't trust each other. They don't have a shared mission. It is very difficult to get teachers to give 100%. It's very difficult. Teachers don't go into it for the money or the fame. They go into it for the kids and they go into it because they want to influence the future. And so by keeping the focus on that mission and on the future, it's a lot easier to keep teachers engaged. I would say that's the main way I do it from a group perspective. I really take a lot of time to walk around and to listen. God gave me two ears and one mouth, and I need to listen twice as much as I talk. And what I have found with with my colleagues is that when they feel heard and listened to, even if it's not always the answer they want, but they feel that they've been given that opportunity, they are more likely to give 100% in the classroom. And unlike, I think, some conventional wisdom that says, you know, the more oversight these teachers have, the, you know, the better they'll do, I actually like the exact opposite. I think that micromanaging is one of the surefire ways for teachers to become disengaged. They need to be empowered to lead within their classroom. Most teachers do not want to be administrators. I mean, the joke is they take the bad teachers and they make make them administrators. I hope that's not true in my case, but here nor there, they just want to be the best version of themselves. And if, if we as educational leaders are not listening to them, not empowering them, not standing back and saying, I trust you to lead in your classroom, we will not get 100% from those teachers. It doesn't matter how great the curriculum is or how much money we have or how wonderful the parents are. Teachers have to be empowered to be the leaders within their own classrooms. And those are really probably the two biggest ways that I, on a more kind of global level, really dig deep to support teachers to get them to put in 100%. The other is if I see that a teacher is suffering, I really believe in a lot of grace. Teachers are there because they love it, but that doesn't mean they don't have other priorities. They may have a sick parent. They may have a child with special needs. They may be going back to graduate school. They may have a really long commute. They're people too. And so it's working with teachers and saying, what is it that I can do to serve your needs, to put you in a position to feel good about coming here? So I had a teacher who's like, look, I see a therapist on this day at this time. I'm not going to be able to make a meeting. Can you please work with me to not schedule our meetings then? I said, that's a no brainer. We're done. Absolutely. Because I want to support that teacher's mental health. And she's trusted me with that information and I shouldn't take advantage of that trust. And so sometimes it is difficult because you may say yes or no to something or to somebody and it may look inconsistent, but it's being equitable and it's, it's affording grace and allowing grace where it's needed, but also having the high expectations. But I, but I do find that those personal relationships and, and allowing teachers to be themselves. And a lot of times when you've said it, when you go into your classroom, you're either hundred percent and you're on, or you might be eaten alive and teachers to give hundred percent have to be in a place where they can't. So they need to be trusted. They need to have a healthy culture. They need to be mission driven, and then they need to have their needs met. I have found that I get 90 plus percent of my teachers on board with that approach. And then it's just some individual here and there type of stuff. You know what the other big thing is? We, I think as a society, when it comes to teachers, we need to stop punishing everyone for the sins of a few. And I just remember I was a competitive soccer player and tennis player. And I always hated when, when one person screwed up, the entire team had to do something. And I understood from the coach's perspective that they were trying to get everyone to engage in like positive peer pressure, right? And sometimes it can work. But I think when it comes to teachers, like if you have someone not following the dress code, do not send an email to every single teacher because the teachers following the dress code are the ones who are going to say, oh my God, I did something wrong. No, you need to go to the teacher specifically and say, hey, let's have a conversation not an email, but a dignified, respectful conversation where I lead you into the process and talk to you about why it is that we all follow our dress code. And that's being respectful to that individual teacher, but then it's also being respectful to your colleagues 
by not dragging them down with negative feedback when they're not the ones engaging in the behavior. And those can be really, really tough discussions to have, but they pay dividends off later on because people learn to trust you and they know that they're not going to get nickeled and dimed. They're not going to get micromanaged and they're not going to be blamed for things that they didn't do. And I think those are just some important notes on getting teachers really truly to give a hundred percent because the kids are the easy part. <laughs> the, kid, the kids are the, are the easiest part of the day. It's everything else that goes along with teaching that complicates it. I actually like the model of K to eight, one building school. When you separate elementary, middle school, and high school, it creates chaos. Have you ever been in a middle school? That's a public school. It is chaos. I've talked about it on the podcast. I, you could talk to any middle school teacher. They say it's crazy because you're putting all of those hormones, all of those same mindsets <laughs> into one building. And guess what happens? It festers and it just goes crazy. Versus if you have a K to eight school, what tends to happen for the mindset of that kid is that yes, the hormones are going. Yes, they have a group, but it's a smaller group of students. So maybe in a class, you might have 60 kids versus in a regular class, you have 200 kids. And that difference is night and day. And so now they have those kindergartners in the same building that the middle school kids are in. So what happens is that they say, oh, I have to be a role model. Whether it be subconscious or conscious, they automatically do it in a K-8 school. Exactly. If you don't have them in a K-8 school and they're in middle school, they say, how can I be the big dog? So it's literally a bunch of people trying to be alpha and omega when there's really no one needing to be alpha. You just have to get your education. It's very different. So I prefer the K to eight type of standards or education system because I taught public schools. You can see the difference. And I was fortunate enough. I went to Catholic schools K to eight. And so I can see the difference. When I first got into public schools, I was like, wow, this is insane because it's like almost like a free for all and you have to learn how to juggle things. And yes, you can have a semblance of organization and of functionality in your classroom, but a lot of those students are operating on their own ideals and beliefs. I saw on LinkedIn the other day that it was an assistant principal. He was walking down the hall and he saw some students in the hall and he says, where should you guys be? And then the student said, mind your own business and keep on walking. So that's a public school. It's tough for teachers to say, whoa, that's, that's tough. Going into the realm of public school, I know you might not have embodied wisdom of teaching in public school, but as an education coach, right? Kind of helping those public school teachers deal with those type of students, right? So now they're separated by grade level. So elementary kids are typically pretty sweet, uh, very easy to teach. Middle school is a little bit more difficult and high school is actually pretty simple too, because you just tell them what to do and they get the grade. Right. Middle school is the most difficult one, but kind of going in from each grade level, let's start elementary, then go middle school, then high school. How would you help a public school teacher as an education coach? To start off with the K-8 model, it's interesting you brought that up because there actually is a theory called the top dog theory. And it really does exemplify exactly what you said, where when there's an arc and students engage in that arc of education, like a kindergarten to an eighth grade, there's a natural progression and a natural ending to something and that there is a psychological component to being the top dog in an environment and the expectations that come along with that. Despite the fact that I think a lot of people look around society with social media and think no one's nice anymore. I don't agree with that. I think that we're naturally empathic people, empathetic people. And I think that children are no different and that older children, when they see younger children, they have a natural inclination to want to assist them and to want to mentor them and to help them. And that is sort of built into our DNA. We're very social animals. And it's a really sweet thing to see. With public school teachers that I've worked with and my colleagues in public school are heroes. I think they're doing an amazing job in a system that doesn't always reward the teachers. And I think that oftentimes our public school counterparts are, are demonized for policies and things that they have no control over and that they're working with constraints that someone like the leader that I am in my school, I have a few rules and regulations we follow through the archdiocese, but I'm the chief officer of the school plant. And so I'm making a ton of decisions every day that only affect our environment. And that just doesn't happen in the public school. So I admire my public school colleagues 
Now, I would say, I mean, in K-2, to it is much easier, but we will see behavior problems come up, especially in environments where the kids have experienced a tremendous amount of trauma. And through the pandemic, we saw that, especially with Title I schools. And when we saw those schools having things like free and reduced lunch being pulled out because they were no longer learning in school, they had, there was a lot of inequality and access to technology and things of that nature. We're seeing a pretty wide gap in the type of education those students received in those very formative young years versus their counterparts in a wealthier public school or a private school, so on and so forth. And so I think for those teachers, the number one thing is forgiving yourself before you walk in the door. Teachers are not responsible for society's problems and ills. And for whatever reason, we have thought as a society that if we just add a social emotional learning program, or we just add an anti-bullying program, or we just add something else that somehow we will be able to eradicate all of these problems. Well, teachers are awesome, but we can't save the world. And so I have said to my public school counterparts who feel very heavy with this sense of responsibility for a learning gap that they didn't cause and for technology inequality that they're not responsible for and fractures within a parent relationship or guardians where there's trauma that takes place, they're carrying the weight of that. And I will say to my colleagues, you have to forgive yourself before you walk in the classroom door because you did not cause that trauma. And so when you can flip your mindset away from feeling responsible for something, it's a, I believe it's a little bit more empowering than to say, okay, what can I control? I can control what goes on within my classroom and the impact that I have on these students. And there's a ton of research about how even one involved adult in a young person's life can change their trajectory forever. And in K-2, it's just getting the kids to want to be in the classroom. I mean, that's the number one goal. So forgive yourself when you go in and create an environment that's safe. Maslow's hierarchy of need, food, water, shelter, followed by safety. And if you hit those two things, those kids are going to be in your arms forever. That's when you can actually get to the business of learning. But if you're not hitting those lower Maslow needs first and creating that safe environment in your classroom, you're not going to get to the other stuff. And so I think if educators can do that in K-2, to they're, they're well on their way. Three to five is getting a little dicier because they stop learning to read around third grade and they start reading to learn and that comprehension component comes in. And again, if we're seeing that education, that learning gap from the pandemic, we have a lot of kids who are behind. Same step one, you need to forgive yourself. You are not responsible for where that child is and you need to meet the child where he is and not where you want the child to be. That can be very difficult in public school, especially when some public school districts prescribe like what the teachers have to teach. It's very scripted. And that's really unfortunate because I hear from my public school colleagues, like, I need to stop. I need to reteach. I need to go back over something. I need to give another formative assessment. And I can't because the learning coach who checks on me every Friday is telling me I have to move on because I have to stay on the same page as everyone else. And again, that goes back to, it can be very, very, very demoralizing. And so what I would say to my colleagues in grades three through five, besides forgiving yourself, is to say, again, what can I control in my classroom? What are the ways that I can use what's in my toolbox to sort of circumvent that process a little bit? And I'm definitely not saying go against, you know, what you, <laughs> what your district is telling you to teach. Of course not. But I do believe because really good teachers are doing it every day, there are creative ways around some of what districts are mandating that teachers do. And I am all about feeling empowered as a teacher and saying to yourself, is what I'm asking myself to do in the best interest of students, is it ethical? Is it moral? And if the answer is yes, go for it. And right now with the current teacher shortage that has happened out there, our teachers are in actually a better position than ever to sort of flex, I would say, their power and their muscle a little bit because people are needed in the profession right now. And I think this is the time for teachers to say, wait a second, you need to trust us. These are the things that we need to do to teach our kids to get them ahead. And so I would say to teachers in three to five, feel empowered to take advantage of what's happening in the field to be a disruptor. And to say, I am going to do what my students need. And then you need to seek out colleagues who will support you in that. We can all find the naysayers. We'll find enough people to complain. You need to find the people who will fill your tank and your toolbox with you and follow you along. 
middle school, ah, middle school is its own beast. I was um, a middle school language arts teacher myself for seven or eight years. I jumped actually from first grade to middle school. That was a learning experience, but they're my people. And if I go back into the classroom, my favorite place to go is middle school. They are ornery and angry and oversensitive and egotistical, and they're still the most endearing people in the world. And I just am tickled every day by the middle schoolers. And I think what I would tell middle school teachers is you've got to have a really healthy sense of humor. Because if as a middle school teacher, you take your students' behavior personally, that's going to be the end of it. Because it doesn't matter that it's you or me or anyone else in front of them. They're in a difficult age and stage. And you hit the nail on the head. It is more difficult now to teach middle school than high school with social media, with what's happening with them developmentally, chemically, physically, maturity wise, it is, I mean, it could be a disaster from one day to the other, these poor kids dealing with so many things. And if you take their behavior personally, you're never going to do well in middle school. So I just chuckle. I mean, it comes at me, you know, I've had a student, even in a Catholic school, say things to me that are inappropriate or that are rude. And your first reaction could be to really just bring down the hammer But I usually do my best to not be reactionary and to chew on it and to think, hmm, what was driving that student to react that way or to treat me in that manner? Because children don't do things for no reason. They're driven to do things for a reason. And so I'm usually looking at them as a puzzle and trying to figure it out. So I'm saying healthy sense of humor, not taking the behavior that they engage in and the words that they say personally, and then to step back, separate the child from the words or the behavior and say, what's going on there? Because with middle schoolers, the way that you get them back is to figure out what makes them tick. And if you can identify what makes them tick and relate to them, they're just like the K to two kids. They'll be with you all day long. Someone once said to me that a 14-year-old is like a two-year-old, right? A two-year-old is running away from you and saying, no, 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 the terrible twos, yet looking over their shoulder constantly to see if you're there. Every 14-year-old eighth grader I know says, mom and dad, don't go to my basketball game. Don't come here. But when they don't show up, they're disappointed. And they're, so they're trying to develop their own identity, but they're not ready to develop their own identity quite yet. And so they're in that, that push and pull, which is why one day they're going to be super sweet. And the next, it's like, what happened? This is not the kid I knew a day ago. They are breaking that bond with their parents as or guardians as they develop into more adult humans and have abstract reasoning and those types of things. So great sense of humor, not taking things personally, and then being able to really separate the behavior and the words from the child and figure out what's driving them. And then I find that middle school teachers have a lot more success. You don't have to be the coolest teacher. You don't have to be your kids, you know, your students' friends. You shouldn't do that, but you can be the teacher that they want to talk to because they know that you love them and care about them, but you will hold them accountable for what your expectations are. And I suspect with the assistant principal in that one case, that maybe there needs to be some self-reflection there. Now, are there jerky kids out there? Sure. But what's happening where that's the response? And I'm not saying it's the assistant principal's fault, and I'm not saying that the student was okay to say it, but it deserves some reflection of, hmm, what's going on in our culture, in our environment that a child feels empowered to speak to me that way? And how do I get to the bottom of that? Let's figure that out. So I would just see that more as like an invitation to try and solve that problem. And looking at the high school component, right? Oh, yes. High school. Um, I think it depends on what type of high school you're in. I mean, public high schools in really high achieving areas. So you look at a place like, let's say, um, Silicon Valley in California, where I have a sibling who has children. I mean, it's a pressure cooker. And there, I mean, there's so much pressure for those students to take all AP classes and so on and so forth, that they are really mentally and emotionally hurting on one end of the spectrum. And then you go to an area like downtown Atlanta, and they are suffering on the other end because they're not sure where their next meal is going to come from, or there is violence in the household. And so depending on the school, there are going to be different needs. And I would say similar to middle school, high school teachers, they need to have a healthy sense of humor. They need to not take behavior personally, but I also think that they need to establish their expectations very early on. And you could apply that in any classroom. You know that as a teacher without routines and expectations and all of that, no classroom will run efficiently or effectively. But I think it's most important with high school teachers 
that they set those expectations and that they hold students accountable. And that's what I hear from my former students who are in high school. They can't stand the teachers who have one set of rules for one set of kids and another set of rules for another. So the football player in your class can't have a different rule or different standard than the child on the robotics team. And the expectations should be the same, not necessarily as high, but they should be the same. The best that you can do. It might be an A for one student and a C for another, but was that your best effort? And so I think it's important to establish those expectations and to really make sure that your classroom is an equitable, safe space for any student to be in. And when that happens, that's when the learning can take place. Expectations were what got me through day one saying, hey, these are the expectations. This is how it's going to be. And I think it's important for the students to know that because if they don't, they're just kind of going in, well, okay, well, let's see what I can get away with versus, oh, this is what they say I have to abide by. And if they cross those expectations, the first moment they do it, that's when you check them and you say, hey, this is not going to happen, right? In my classrooms, I always made it very aware that bullying was not going to be tolerated, right? Making fun of people wasn't going to be tolerated in my class. And if you did it in someone else's classroom, I'll give you a dirty look. I'm not going to bring it up because it's not my classroom, but I'm going to be paying attention if you go in my classroom with that behavior, right? I'm going to check you there. It didn't matter if it was elementary school, didn't matter if it was high school. It doesn't matter the grade. My expectations were not to be bent. And I find that teachers who give some leeway to students who, you know, maybe broke a rule or expectations. And guess what? Now that student learned, well, you know, going to school, you learn things. So they learn, oh, I can break these expectations and there's no consequences. There was never a moment when I had an expectation broken that I didn't address the situation. I think that's so important for teachers to realize you create the expectations you want for your classroom and then. Don't be so rigid, especially in middle school, sometimes in high school, is that they're trying to drive a reaction from you. And if they can get your emotions, (laughs) you lost, right? So you have to be able to control your emotions. And and one of the things that I help people with is the idea of understanding that you're in control of your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. And when you can control all three of those, no one else can have an influence on those. That's you. In school, sometimes you have a student. I call students who give you a run for your money heavy hitters. There's no bad kids. I call them heavy hitters. It's just that you have to be careful. Uh, If you're familiar with a baseball analogy, you have the pitcher. You might, you know, be going up against a batter who's just like Babe Ruth. He's going to hit a home run. If if you throw a slow ball, a flop, he's going to hit it out of the park. And some kids are like that, where if they see you're not 100% and they see that they can get away with some of those expectations, they're going to run with it as much as they can. And your life is going to be miserable. So you do have to check it as soon as it happens. And then you typically don't have any issues. And so that was one of the things I was good at uh, when, when it came to discipline for the classroom. I didn't have a classroom management issue. And there were some veteran teachers that were years ahead of me that were struggling with the same classroom. And then I had to ask myself, is it because I'm young, a man, you know, like I was looking at different aspects, like why are they listening to me, but not to the other teachers? And then it came down to the expectations. And it's a critical factor for learning and then raising children, whether you're an educator or you're a parent, the expectations Mm -hmm. have to be there. And then starting from where they are, you know, kind of going back to where you said it's like the pandemic really put some kids behind. So yes, in public school, you might be getting a third grader that's reading on a first grade level. Typically in the public school, we have this idea of, well, you made it to third grade, you should be on the third grade level. That can be far from the truth. So we treat everyone to be on that level. And then that kid has to catch up somehow on their own or through failing grades and then Maybe parents saying, okay, you need a tutor, parents saying you need to yell, and then they finally change, or maybe they don't. I mean, there's a lot to it. And what I have noticed is that we do a disservice to our kids when we give them that expectation of you should be this. Yes, making assumptions about where they are. Mm -hmm. Like you should be this, you should be smart. There's no reason why you should be doing this. And I think being open and being aware and to understand where they are. And one of my cooperating teachers from high school level, he taught me something amazing. He says, I don't care if you are Mozart or Beethoven or whoever, I'm going to start you from the beginning, the basics. And it's his way of saying, if there's any holes in your learning, we're going to fill it. 
versus, Mm -hmm. okay, you are already third graders or high schoolers. You should know all this. But he goes at a very quick pace. Mm -hmm. So he's like, boom, 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 boom from the basics. And then he's able to fill in as many holes. And he's able to see which students need Mm -hmm. that more support because they might have missed something, right? So he can easily say, hey, you know, like if we need some help with this, we can, you know, this is important so we can get to the next step. I think that's a critical factor in education to figure out where the kid is and then adjusting to that. Not saying that you're going to adjust the whole classroom. I think many parents get this idea in their head. They say, oh, well, this person is reading at a first grade level. My kid's reading at a fifth grade level. So now my kid has to be behind because someone else's kid is not caught up. So then it creates that animosity between parents. And then parents are coming in, they're yelling at the teacher, they're yelling at the principal, and they're cursing the kid because they're keeping their kid behind. For any parent to not look at their kid as amazing and like, oh, like like my kid is so smart. Like I, I completely understand that sentiment. But at the same time, you need to be realistic too, because I've taught many things. One of the things I taught was swimming. It didn't matter how good you were in school or how nice of a person you are. Do you know how to kick? Do you know how to move your arms in the water? Similar to school. Do you know how to read? Do you know how to walk down the hall in line? It's like, Small factors make up for the bigger picture. And I think I think sometimes we forget the small factors that make up the bigger picture. I know some of the work you do as an education coach is making sure people are aware of the whole aspect of education. It's more than just send your kids to school and by the time they're graduated from high school, they'll know everything they need to know for the world. That's yeah. so far from the truth. As much as I wish to say, like our school systems are, are doing a great job at preparing our children to be effective adults, that is not true. I saw that gap when I was in schools and it's kind of the main reason why I left the school because I saw the gaps that were going to be left behind. And I said, these young adults now are going to be arriving with questions and fears and concerns, and they needed some guidance. And same as how you said, it's kind of like having that one mentor, having that one person being able to listen to them and give some advice. It can't be a parent. I completely understand that. I've had parents come to me saying, when you have kids, you're going to know that you need someone else. It takes a village, right? Where you might want to do it. You might have all the credentials to do it, but having someone else in the mix is going to play a critical developmental role for that child. You could be a great basketball player. Give your kid a basketball coach because they're going to learn from that coach. If they learn from you, you're going to be giving them a false idea of who they should become. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm this good. You need to be better than me versus a coach saying, hey, you're amazing at this jump shot you know, shoot your shot, right? So they're they're looking at their strengths versus the overall compare and contrast. And we live in a world where comparisons are the new norm, where yes. I'm going to compare my kid to your kid, or I'm going to compare this teacher to that teacher, the equality way of thinking. In your work as an education coach, if you could change one thing in the system of education, whether it be from the teacher side, from the parent side, from society side, what would that change be? That is a very, it's an excellent question, but it is a difficult one to answer because education is so complicated. But if I had a wand and I could just sweep across education, I would remove politics from the classroom. And we saw this throughout the pandemic that parents were pitted against everything from the teacher to the principal to the school board. And I mean, we saw people, I mean, I watched stuff on the news and I mean, people were just losing it. But I think if you polled any one of those people, a parent, a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, and you really asked them what they wanted and you made a list, I bet that they would have answered almost exactly the same. It's how they were getting from one place to the other. And then for some reason now, and I think it might be the social media culture, whatever it is, if I don't agree with you, you are a bad person. Or if you don't like my opinion, then I don't want to engage with you. And that's a lot of what I saw happening. And that's what bothers me in education is we could take those politics out of it. I think it would be extremely helpful because I do believe that both sides want the same things. It's just the messaging and the politics that have gotten involved have gotten so convoluted and so uh, just messed up that it has... The only people that it's hurt are the kids. That's the the worst part about it is the we're the adults in the room yelling and screaming at each other. And it's the children who pay the price of that. 
And so I think that if we could wave a wand and somehow, I know it's impossible, but somehow get politics out of education, it would be a game changer. The second would be if we could create equitable schools for all. That is just something that breaks my heart. A child living in rural Mississippi should have access to the same quality education that a child living in Buckhead, Georgia, which is an upper middle class area of Atlanta. And as a teacher, it breaks my heart that we haven't figured it out in the hundreds of years that we have had schools that we have not been able to figure out how to provide good quality schools to to every child. I I love what you said there. Um, if I ever get a magic wand, I'm going to give it to you. Because, Thank you. <laughs> because <laughs> yes, politics and the idea of having school equality, regardless of where you are, is so important. And I think sometimes people fail to understand that the children are the next generation leaders. They're going to be leading us at some point. And we can either equip them to be successful or we can equip them to fail. Right now, there could be a debate on this, but we can be better. We can be in a better place. Some of the work you do is starting that aspect of trying to get to that better place. And the work you do as an educational coach and a principal is to be respected and for people to be able to see the work that you do as saying, okay, you know what, maybe I should get an education coach for my district or for my school or to talk about my kid, right? Mm -hmm. And then start that conversation because education, as you said, is extremely complex. It's not as simple as, again, turning to page 10, reading the page, and then you are automatically Einstein. It's right. more than that, right? And we have such a unique variety of personalities. And then, of course, mindsets going into the schools. You just can't choose a narrow path for everyone to follow down and say, okay, this is how you should be. This is what you should be going for. You choose. And schools sometimes give limiting beliefs to children. Mm -hmm. And I have made it my mission to turn those limiting beliefs around. Revan is just never turned backwards. Yeah. And it's a whole story. We can talk about it later because our time is running short. And I could talk to you all day about <laughs> education. I could talk to you all day about the work you do because it is important. And I do want you to understand that the work you do is impacting the world. And that's why I wanted to have you on to talk about the work you do and then to give you a platform for parents to reach out to you to say, hey, how can I make my kid better? And it's not that your kid is bad. Mm -hmm. It's equipping them with all the tools and the resources they need to be their best self mm -hmm. that they can at that point. And as we grow up, we get stronger. Our mind gets stronger. And yes, our mind might change. Life might move a different way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't do things, right? We shouldn't be idle. We shouldn't just sit by the waysides and do nothing. We can make an impact. And I think a great place to start, whether you be an administrator, an educator, or a parent, to seek out a way where you can make sure your kid, your child is getting the best education that they can. So if I can from you, Melissa, can you give me any last words and then please share how people can find you? Well, I, it was such an honor and a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much. I think that if I could send one message to the fellow educators out there, it's you are doing the good work and you don't hear that enough. And I want to send that to all of my colleagues in education, whether you teach in a Catholic school or another religious school or a public school, we are in this together. We are all working for the future of our kids. And so I want to just thank all of the teachers out there. For the parents, I just want to send a message that says, you know, it does take a village and you do have a lot of resources and people out there to help you. No one expected you to be a teacher during the pandemic. Um, and that it's okay. And that we will get through this together. And so I wanted to send that to, to the parents out there. Um, as far as getting a hold of me, my email is Melissa Lowry. E-D-U at Gmail. And that's just M-E-L-A-S-S-A, L-O-W-R-Y, E-D-U at gmail.com. Anyone can email me. I'd love to hear from you. My website is Melissa Lowry Education Coaching.com. So I'm out there. I think I'm Melissa Lowry EDU at Twitter, but I don't really tweet. And I'm Melissa Lowry EDU on Instagram, but I, I'm not out there that much. And I live under a rock, so I'm not on Facebook. Um, so I don't do that either. The school that I'm at is Christ the King. So it's ChristKing.org if you want to check that out. But 
I'm just here. If anyone would like to reach out, I'm just more than happy to help anyone who needs assistance. And I will put all that information in the description box below so people can easily find you. I want to thank you so much, Melissa, for spending some time with me today. Great conversation. Well, thank you so much. Again, it was an honor and a pleasure. And I just um, thank you for the good work that you're doing with your coaching out there as well. I really enjoy listening to your episodes. I would like to thank my guest, Melissa Lowry, for coming on Coaching in Session. As you can see, she is a wealth of information. You can really tell that she can see the problems and then she has some ideas for how we can fix it. And she said something interesting that it might be impossible to change the school system or to change how we're moving or the trajectory of how education is. Very much so. But here at Reverend Concepts, we turn never around. And we really, truly want to turn those impossible moments and make impossibilities because if there's a will, there's a way. So how can we turn around the education system? How can we make that impossible factor possible? Well, we have to begin with us, right? We have to look at how we can change and then start to make the changes there. Because if we try to change the world, the world is going to keep on changing before we can even keep up. So if we focus on changing ourselves, everyone changes for themselves and then giving themselves the idea of, okay, this is my change. It's my change. You don't have to look at someone else and say, you need to also mimic my change because my change is the best. Your change might be amazing. It might be awesome. But just because you had a change in a certain area or certain direction, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone should do the same exact change that you did. Yes, there might be some similarities in the change where, you know, like the mindset changes or your viewpoints, things like that. But one of the things that we really have to dive into is the idea of we are us. We are unique in the sense of how I think is how I think. How you think is how you think. But if we look at what humans technically really want is to be happy, is to be at peace. Sometimes we do a huge disservice to ourselves and we give ourselves problems. We take away our peace and we take away our happiness. So we need to figure that out, right? That's a critical aspect, a vital aspect in the realm of education. And when we look at education coaching is so much more than just, all right, you need to read this book or you need to teach this way because our conversation today wasn't like, oh, you need to read this and you need to do that. It's talking about how we learn, how we're thinking, how our mind is thinking, our mindset. And as a mindset coach, that is what I focus on. How can we give you the mindset that you need to be an effective parent? How can we give you the mindset that you need to be an effective teacher or administrator? It stems in all of your life, your mindset. If you have a bad relationship, for example, it stems from mindset. If you have a bad career, it stems from mindset. Maybe you have a terrible boss. But it's going to stem from mindset too, because you can have a terrible boss and still love the work you do. And if you don't love the work you do, then what are you doing? Because it can show that you have some type of scarcity type of mindset. You have some type of fear blocking you, roadblocks. You might have fallen into a circumstance and it's difficult to get out of it. You can make the change. We need to stop allowing our circumstances to validate why we feel so crappy, why we feel so bad. We can make the change. If you don't feel good, change. If you don't like the way things are going, change them, right? But you have to change yourself first. And I think I think that's the starting point. Let's start to begin to change ourselves. And I think that's the starting point. Let's begin to change ourselves. And then, of course, things will fall in line too. And don't be upset if you're doing the right thing, quotation marks, if you're doing the right thing and someone else is not doing the right thing because that's their life. You're not here to control other people's lives. It might seem that in education, the teachers are controlling your children The system is controlling your children. It's not that. I know many wonderful teachers from my years teaching, from coaching in session, from Reverend Concepts, and I would say about 90 plus percent want the best for your child. We have to be able to support that type of development, that type of promotion into the ranks of who your child can become because there's going to be a lot of adversity, but it shouldn't happen in the classroom because the world is already so negative and those are adult problems and Though the kids will experience those problems here and there, it is not something that we should give them as a foundation for how they learn and how they live in life. So I encourage everyone to check out Melissa, her website, send her an email. If you love the podcast, if you love what she said, I know I love what she said. She said so many wonderful things and many of the things she spoke about, if we can pay attention to those, they're going to be some of the components that 
can help remedy what's happening in education, what's happening in the school systems, what's happening in the households. Because it seems like we're diverging away from cordiality, from respect, from love, from happiness, from peace. And we're going to this negativity and hate and despair that can be avoided. And I encourage everyone to seek out a coach, whether it be a mindset coach, life coach, an education coach, and the learned methods that are going to help you become better, to help you prosper in any regards, and to help your kids prosper if you have children. Because in the end, the children are our future, and it's up to us to give them a path to walk on. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me, session at gmail.com, and I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.